breaking the wall of human embryo creation. How stem cell models are revolutionizing insights into embryonic growth. Magdalena Szanitska Goetz, California Institute of Technology. On November the 9th, 1989, I was in Warsaw, Poland, doing my PhD. Uh, this is so really lovely to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. And what I'm going to do within the next 15 minutes of our life is to take you through the journey of the beginning of our life, the journey that we know so little about as it happens within the body of the mother. So when we think about this journey, when we think about the earliest stages of dance of life, I call it dance of life, it's our first dance. I promise there were no more dances before that. When I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about the huge mystery, a mystery the generation of scientists are trying to resolve. And understanding of this mystery is so, so difficult because it really happens deeply inside the body of the mother. Therefore, access to the human life, to our life, at very early stages of this life being initiated is, is really hidden. So, nevertheless, we know a few things. So we know for sure that life starts with the unique fusion of two unique cells. One is a lonely egg that comes together with one of many successful sperms that will uh, fertilize this egg. And when you fertilize the egg, really this set off something that is incredibly powerful. It starts the life of all of us and is able to generate all this diversity of forms that you can see on this slide. So we know that the very first thing that this fertilized egg, after the act of this union of two cells, have to do is to establish a community of cells. And this community of cells is unique in a way that every single cell has to start to find its function. So you might look at it and think this is a little bit like community that we build uh, in society that we have to uh, decide the function for different members of that society. Here, in the case of cells, they have to decide which group of cells will make the future head, which will make the heart, which will make placenta, or yolk sac, in which embryo will grow within the body of the mother. So you might think these decisions are simple, but they are perhaps the most complex decisions in our life, and yet we take them without even thinking about them. So why do I think they are so complex? Uh, not only because studying them reveals more and more complexity on a path, but also because great majority of these initiated lives in this way actually fail. Majority of lives ends before we even know we are pregnant. It is the first two weeks of our life when majority of the death occur. So the question is what it is that our embryo finds so, so difficult to go through when it starts its life. So to be able to address the question, uh, I uh, had to break down two walls, and uh, two walls that I uh, met when I started on that path. The, find, the first wall was the dogma that existed in my field that all of the cells are identical, and therefore the beginning of life is actually less mysterious than we found it is. The second wall was on technological level. So going to the, to the first wall. So when I started, it was 1998, so a little bit uh, longer than when the real wall in Berlin fell down. But nevertheless, it was still a huge wall to fall down for me. The belief was that all of those cells in this early embryo, until human or mouse embryo that often is used to study human embryo development, has 16 cells, are equal to each other. The thought was that they are identical and all totipotent. But actually, it was not possible to know it at the time, and there was no way to label those individual cells to follow their fate. So the first wall that I had to uh, break was uh, to establish a system that will allow us to paint individual cells. And we do it in two different ways. We either put these external markers of cells so we can follow their fate, or we micro-inject fluorescent proteins that when we shine the blue light with the microscope, they fluoresce green. So we did this first in the mouse, and then we uh, got access to the unique group of 
surplus IVF human embryos that were donated for research. And we were able to micro-inject them with those fluorescent markers and do time-lapse movies that allow us to follow life from the time of birth of each individual cell until their destiny become decided. And these studies revealed something really uh, profound. We found that actually cells start to differ from each other at the earliest time possible, at the two-cell stage. One of these two cells is the one that will divide first, will create those inside cells, and this is the cell that will create majority of our organs. Why the second cell will decide to actually uh, not speed up in development, I'm saying decide in inverted commas, those cells of course don't make a conscious decision, but uh, will divide slower and will contribute to the placenta. So when we have this embryo, the blastocyst stage with inside and outside cells, the second thing that this embryo has to do is to implant in the body of the mother. And this process of implantation is very invasive and very, very drastic change for the embryo. For the very first time, this embryo has to attach physically to the uterine wall within the body of the mother. And these cells that look very simple and are uh, present in the form of ball of cells have to change their shape. So there will be three lineages that I will talk, you, uh, talk through uh, today. Um, uh, I will talk about them. The first red are the cells that are embryonic epiblasts. So these are the cells that will make every single cell of the future body. They were gray on the previous slide because we track lineages from the two cell stage. And blue and green cells are the cells that do not contribute to our body but they build extra embryonic structures, such as placenta. And those structures are very important for the embryo to survive. So for this to happen, embryo have to go back to the body of the mother, touch the body of the mother, and then it gets a signal to start to grow and explore totally different shape. So this is a huge morphog morphological transformation that embryo will take in that at the time. And mouse and human embryo do it differently. The first image of the cylindrical structure is of the mouse, and the second is of the human embryo. So to be able to observe how this transition happened, we had to develop a new technology, which is a culture system that would allow us to look uh, at the embryo as in it implants, not in the body of the mother, but on a plastic dish. So we did it first for the mouse, and then we did it for human embryo, and for the very first time, we're able to actually observe how those individual cells put on stage by the time of implantation, at the blastocyst stage, talk to each other, which signals they exchange, whether they also exchange mechanical signals to build, it, to build this much more complex embryo. So one thing I wanted to tell you that, for example, we found that this group of green cells that you see in the last image is the group of cells that become specified on the 10th day of our life. And this group of cells is the one that will decide where to position our future head. So we didn't know this happened so early in the human embryo life. We knew about this group of cells in mouse. We were able to interfere, to infer what this group of cells will do in humans. But for the very first time, we can look at the power of this uh, signaling center, as we call it. So I'm often asked, what did we find at this stage of development that would explain why as many as 30% 30 per, 30 of pregnancy fail at the time? So one of the major discoveries was how those group of uh, apolarized, so non-polarized uh, cells that will make the epiblast become polarized and form this beautiful three-dimensional rosette-like structure. At the time of this morphological transition, cells have to exit from the naive state of their potency to new state that it's called primed, primed for differentiation and formation of the future organs in the process called gastrulation. So we found that this transition has to be coordinated on many levels between the three tissues involved. And mimic this transition in culture was essential for us, for this pregnancy in culture, to progress. So finally, what I would like to do at the end is to tell you how we use the knowledge that came out from uh, tracking individual cells before, during, and after implantation to build embryo-like models 
uh, from stem cells. So there are three types of stem cells that are graphically represented in uh, sort of three portraits of mouse that have to come together to create new life. One will make the proper body, so epiblast and this other two extra embryonic tissues are the ones that provide signals. So we wonder whether we would be able to recreate embryo-like structure if we just use the right proportions of stem cells for these three tissues. And this was possible to do it because we have access to embryonic stem cells that are shown in red here. Zen cells that form one of these extra embryonic tissues called primitive endoderm and blue cells that form another that will form later placenta called trophoectoderm. So we found different type of conditions, uh, numbers of the cells uh, and proportions that have to be put together uh, for the embryo-like structure to uh, be created, particularly importantly at post-implantation stages, as this is such a difficult stage of our life to follow. So what we were able to establish, it, uh, establish through these studies is how these three compartments are built, how these individual cells talk to each other to create this self-assembly process. I wish to say that it's really self-assembly. We don't engineer it by taking one cell, putting one cell in and then one cell out. We just put the right proportion of cells together and then they will do the job. So over the last eight years, we built um, around seven of those models for mouse and human using different proportions of cells and trying which uh, conditions are the most successful for future life. And I would like to show you the most advanced mouse embryo model. So you see it can develop in culture for eight days and form heart-like structures and brain-like structures. So what about human? stem cells? Can they be equally successful if we manipulate them? So there are less, uh, this, this system uh, with human stem cells and, uh, is less uh, efficient. So here we use uh, human embryonic stem cells and human embryonic stem cells that we program to two different fates. So that's why we have again three major actors that we place together in this dish. And after four days of development, they look like human embryo looks on the 10th day of its life. And the system is around 20% efficient. In 1% of cases, 1% of cases only, so very inefficiently, this embryo, though, can develop structure, this embryo-like structure, I should say, develop further and form the structure that looks like 14-day-old human embryo, the one that initiated the process of gastrulation. So I wish to say that in normal development, uh, we have the successive string of events that allow the formation of these cell types and then those cell types to talk to each other to form the new structure. Now we can actually skip these first few days of our life as long as we provide right conditions at right time and at right place for those stem cells for these three lineages to come together. As with every single new discovery, uh, there are ethical consideration and legal consideration. And I often think about it, so that's why I didn't want to miss this slide. I wish to say that those embryo models, they cannot be used for reproductive purposes. But they are absolutely essential, and they are already providing insight into why it is so that so many pregnancies fail. 60% of pregnancies fail at the time, when we can actually find an insight to it by building those embryo models and find out how it is that tissues are formed in three dimensions and organs start to be built. I don't know why my actor is not coming. I'm extending and extending and extending. And I've forgotten to mention my two amazing artists who are actually self-organizing these embryo-like structures on both sides of the screen. And I wonder how this face would look like. We agree that we will be shaping face here. So I can't finish without thanking every single person in my team and all our collaborators for making all of this work possible. So my team is a little bit like embryo colony, consists of very diverse community, uh, and we are coming from different backgrounds. We all work together and we all help each other to make the study possible and successful. And thank you very much for, for listening. Thank you.